Hello and welcome to Bear Investing. So, if you're new here to the channel, this is just a a place where you can follow along with my Canadian portfolio that I have on Wealth Simple. I have a TFSA and I started an RSP just recently. So you can follow along with my buys and sells and different little news that uh, affects companies I hold or just any any lessons that I can learn, you know, from week to week as I you know, make good decisions or make a bad decision, I uh, should be able to uh, pick up some insight and some valuable lessons, maybe uh, find some value and uh, help that help make you a better investor. Um, so please follow along uh, with the journey. To do that, you can just subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're nearing 400 subscribers and I'm going to get into a topic about um, what I find really important in a business, um, I would say adaptability, quality, good leadership, and I'm going to demonstrate that with one of the companies I purchased today, uh, Brookfield Asset Management. So uh, tune in for that later in the video. Uh, there's going to be an interview with the CEO, and we'll also be going over the Canadian banks and the taxation that's been imposed on them. And we'll also get into Tesla potentially getting into the mining business for lithium. So that's quite interesting. So if that sounds interesting, uh, stick around and let's roll the intro and get into it. And I got a free stock from Sam Reit. So thank you so much for using my referral link in the description below. So I got a free stock and let's see what we got here. So I got BCS. So I got $9.88. So that's going to help me grow my portfolio. And uh, you also got a free stock for using my referral link in the description below. So if you haven't already, uh, join Wealth Simple using my link in the description to get a free stock worth up to $4,500. So the market has been down this past few days actually uh, so we'll just get into the RRSP just because it's our smaller account very quickly um, so we just started this about you know two weeks ago so we have $273.42 in it we're down 7% we only hold one position Starbucks so put about $50 into this so we're up to 2.66 shares uh, it's taken a bit of a dip lately mainly due to you know unionization threats and uh, the fact that China is shut down completely and it's definitely going to impact starbucks's numbers so this one could continue going down in the short term but that's okay i'm just going to continue to average into the business i like the company i'm comfortable with the price that i've paid uh, you have no control over uh, where your stocks are going to head at least in the short term nobody is going to time the perfect bottom price of any stock and no one's going to time selling at the absolute top just focus on buying a quality business when it's at an attractive price and just hold it for the long term it's a pretty brutal week for the tfsa as well we're at thirteen thousand one hundred twenty nine dollars and 99 cents so we're down about 431 dollars down three percent for the week again totally fine uh, i love volatility uh, as a dividend investor it's just great i get more opportunities to invest in quality businesses, get a higher dividend yield, and get more ownership of a fantastic company. So volatility is great if you have a long-term mindset and you keep your eye on the long-term goal of investing, not the short-term price fluctuations, good or bad. Uh, so uh, let's just get into what I bought. So Apple's doing fairly well in this shaky market uh algonquin finally in the green it's been red almost throughout my entire ownership but uh this stock seems to be doing well one of the only things in the green bob is doing terrible uh as it as it's always been doing since i've since i've owned the stock uh so i bought another share of brookfield asset management and uh the reason is i really like the valuation i want it to be a core holding of mine and uh, there was a recent interview with the CEO, Bruce Flatt. So uh, he really goes into explaining what Brookfield is. Um, he shows the 
adaptability of the business over time, uh, what makes them successful, and he really just lays it out for you. So this made me more excited about the company uh, and the performance of it. It's absolutely crushed the S&P 500 over 20, 30 years. That's not luck. Uh, they make great low-risk investments. Uh, they buy assets that are undervalued, and then they hold them uh, for the long term to you know, uh, take part in the cash flow or value that they generate. Or, you know, maybe they sell it later off into the future for a, a gigantic profit. Um, so th they're really open. Uh, they love buying distressed assets at opportune times. Uh, so like if real estate's cheap, they'll buy real estate. If infrastructure's cheap, they'll buy infrastructure. If renewable energy is out of favor, they're going to buy. So any opportunity they can get to get a low risk uh, ret but very high rate of return, they're going to take. Uh, so here is an interview with Bruce Flatt that shows the adaptability of Brookfield, uh, excellent leadership from Bruce Flatt, and just consistent performance over long periods of time. Let me ask you about the background of how you came to be here and the background of the firm, so make sure people understand. Uh, Brookfield was started when? Uh, you know, it's been a, a listed company uh, for a long, long time, and uh, the current group, uh, took it over uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And today, you're managing assets under management of how much? Circa 700 billion. And, uh, and really what happened is, it was an industrial conglomerate, uh, similar to what Berkshire Hathaway was, a mini version of what Berkshire Hathaway was, and uh, we started that in Canada. And um, we built out those businesses and then decided that the way that we could fund the business without taking undue risk was to start partnering with clients, with institutions. And eventually, we brought institutions into deals and eventually we did what many of the other um, private equity firms were doing, which was raise funds. So for people who don't really follow your background, what you're saying, I guess, is that initially you basically were investing the money that your company had. It was a publicly traded company from the early days, is that right? Yes. And so you invested off your balance sheet, and then subsequent to that, you went out and raised third-party money. So you now do both. You invest your own balance sheet, which is considerable, and you rest, invest third-party money, is that right? Yeah, which I guess, the, and that's really the difference of where, where we came from and where many of the private equity firms came from, like Carl Al, was you started a fund management business, raised funds from people, and invested their money. We had our own money, invested in our own businesses, and, and over time we figured out which ones we liked. And then we raised money around those businesses. So for example, we were in the mining businesses. It was very volatile and it was tough all around the world. We decided to sell off the mining businesses, but, we, but we, what we figured out, there was two businesses in there that were spectacular. One was owning global infrastructure. Many of the things we built for mines were in global backbone infrastructure. So we, we took that and learned it. We actually kept some of the assets and, and started an infrastructure business. And our, our renewables business today, which is one of the largest in the world, started because we had hydro plants in our mining businesses. And we were, had water facilities that produced renewable power. Then we got into, later on, solar and wind and all the renewables that are, are today. So you became the CEO in 2002. Since that time, the market capitalization of Brookfield is up by about 2,000%, and the stock price is up about 18, uh, I guess it's 1,800%. So that's pretty good. Um, you have a lot of shareholders calling you, thanking you all the time. Look, anyone that uh, started out with us then, uh, uh, has done really, really well. So they're all happy. You, can, you, can, you can't, uh, maybe there's somebody that's unhappy, but if you've been around for 30 years with us. Uh, you are, are you the largest infrastructure investor in the world? Yeah, if not the largest, close to it, okay. yes. For people that don't really understand infrastructure investing, can you explain what you actually do? Because historically, governments would build an airport or governments would build a road or a bridge. What is it that you do with infrastructure investing that replaces the government but also enables you to make a profit? So uh, m maybe most, uh, to give you the broad spectrum of what infrastructure is, this is, what, this is the backbone of the global economy. So anything behind the scenes 
that's provided to assist people move around businesses operate. And so it's anything from um, uh, telecom towers, data centers for cloud, uh, toll roads, pipelines, transmission systems of electricity transmission lines, which sometimes you would see out there. So all of those things are the backbone of global infrastructure. And um, they're, they, what, what's happened over the years is that governments can't afford, because they have so much debt, they can't afford to provide that infrastructure anymore. So that's moving into private hands. And because there are relatively uh, consistent streams of income, we can leverage them uh, quite successfully and therefore earn excellent returns on investment. So that was a great interview from Bruce Flat. You gain a lot of insight into how Brookfield originated, uh, how they were in the mining business. They found out that, you know, uh, it's tough, brutal, but there were aspects of it they liked, which was owning infrastructure and uh, renewable, you know, water plants, stuff like that. So they they learned what they liked. They found out what, what worked, what was profitable, what was easy, and they just replicated it ever since. And uh, they used to invest their own money, but now they take institutional clients' money. So think like a bank or insurance company. They want to earn a lot of interest off the money that you give them, you know, your interest-free loan to them, and they just make high returns for institutional clients. So if the bank can trust these guys to uh, make an excellent return, I don't see why you can't trust them. Uh, they've they've been a uh, just a quality name. It's basically the Berkshire Hathaway of Canada. So uh, if you're familiar with Warren Buffett, you know you know about Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, and uh, Scotiabank uh, and uh, all the Canadian banks have been down uh, due to this new uh, tax hike uh, proposed by the Liberal government. The government announced that they were going to implement the Canada Recovery Dividend, uh, which banks and life insurers will pay a one-time 15% tax on taxable income above $1 billion for the 2021 tax year. Uh, the Canada Recovery Dividend will be paid in equal installments over five years, so uh, the banks will have to pay this like one-time uh, tax over the next five years. Uh, I don't see that as a big deal. They also want to permanently increase the corporate income tax of banks by 1.5% of banking and life insurance groups above $100 million. Um, so they could have raised it a little bit more to 3%, but uh, I guess they're just going for 1.5. Again, I think the banks will be fine long term. This is a short term dip, in my opinion. Uh, because honestly, I don't think increasing taxation on the banks is a good thing because our entire Canadian economy runs through the banks. And if you increase the cost on the banks, well, think about it. How does a bank make money? They make money on you from charging you high rates of interest. Oh, and also, by the way, interest rates are going up on loans. So they're going to make even more money from that. They can also raise your uh, fees for your bank account uh, for transactions. Like the bank, like really it's a tax on the Canadian taxpayer because everybody needs a bank account. Everybody pays money to the to the bank. The bank makes money off everybody. Uh, so if the Canadian government taxes the banks, which is basically the financial backbone of our entire economy, you're really, you're really the one paying the tax. So I'm, I'm a, not a huge fan of this, not even just as an investor. I just think it's a terrible idea from the government and it's not like they know how to spend money effectively anyway. So this is just a complete waste and it's just gonna increase the cost of living even more. And I purchased another share of ENS. So we went up to 59 shares of this. So a little bit more Enbridge, getting a little bit more income into the portfolio every single month, uh, nearly a 10% yield. I bought more ETHY, which is an Ethereum ETF. Uh, it's a way to get crypto exposure, but get a monthly dividend each and every month, uh, it's about a 15% yield or so. So very high yield, very high risk investment. That's why it's only about 2% of my portfolio. That is what I'm comfortable with. Uh, it's also very, very volatile. So I, if you are going to get into it, I'd say dollar cost average into this one. Just wait for crypto to be out of favor and then get in um, if that's something you want to do. And, we, and Loblaws also went up even higher. So actually the, uh, the dispute with uh, Frito-Lay that they used to have, uh, Pepsi owns Frito-Lay and essentially they did, stopped stocking their products for about two months. 
And I think this really shows the power that Loblaws has. They are 35% of the Canadian grocery store market. I mean, that's, that's insane. Uh, so the fact that they just plain refused, you know, no pun intended to, you know, have Lay's products in their stores, it really just goes to show, you know, who holds the cards that, you know, they have so much leverage. They can just say to Pepsi, you know what? No, we're not going to have your chips and we're, we're not going to pay your price increases because they, they want to get the best available price uh, for, for everything they have. Uh, d even despite, you know, the rising cost of manufacturing food, uh, Loblaws still has to make money at the end of the day. I mean, if, if, um, if, if they pay whatever Pepsi wanted for Frito-Lay, you'd be paying way more for a bag of chips. So it kind of benefits you as the consumer as well. Although, yes, it does help their bottom line, but it also does help you in the end because ultimately you're the one that pays for the grocery bill at the end of the day. Uh, so yeah, Loblaws winning this just really shows to me that they're dominant. And, and they did this earlier uh, with um, Mondelez, I believe, uh, when uh, they refused to stock Oreos uh, for Oreos for like two weeks or something. And then they, they came into an agreement. So they have used their uh, large economic power of just owning a third over a third of the Canadian grocery store market. And they're not going to be strong armed into taking any kind of a deal or a price increase that they don't approve of. So Loblaws is dealing from a position of power, and I think that's the mark of a great business. The fact that you can just tell Pepsi, like, no, we're not going to accept your price increase. You're going to come to a fair deal with us that we determine is fair. <laughs> so that's uh, that's great as a Loblaws shareholder. I, I wish I bought more, but again, that's you could say that about any stock that you buy, and then it immediately jumps up by an insane margin. I've held this for a month. It's already up 17%. Absolutely insane performance. I also averaged a little bit more into Microsoft, so this dipped into the 280s. I figured this is a great time to get into it. Uh, so we'll see how the market shakes out. If Microsoft tumbles more, then I'm going to continue uh, buying a little bit more. And then, you know, TD just like BNS is down due to that uh, news of the increased taxes on Canadian banks. And Tesla actually has some pretty cool news uh, that they may be getting into lithium mining. So uh, again, this is the quality that I, I mentioned earlier in the video, which is I really like a business that can adapt and change over time. Because you know, the, the business that doesn't evolve will go extinct. And I think Tesla is just a great example of a business that thinks like three steps ahead. They're, they're doing things no other car company is doing. Um, so uh, one other example of Tesla doing this was, you know, they decided to, like NVIDIA made a self-driving chip for them. NVIDIA looked at it and basically said, you know what, this is crap. This is absolutely horrendous. And they basically made something on their own that was cheaper and w like 10 times better than what NVIDIA came up with. So the fact is they're not settling like if they don't like something or if a supplier is not doing a good job on a product or there's just simply um one product is just too expensive to buy secondhand from a manufacturer tesla's going to do it themselves they're going to operate every facet of their business and with that vertical integration they're going to own every every single part of their car they're not going to be at the whim of a supplier you know, that increases prices on them, and that'll help maintain their, their pricing power and their high gross margin, uh, which they are absolutely dominating the auto industry, uh, even though it's, you know, it, the company hasn't been around that long, but they are just doing so many things. They recently opened uh, Giga Texas and Giga Berlin, so they're going to be able to produce a lot more vehicles this year, uh, even despite the shutdown in Shanghai. And here's actually an interview uh, from Gene Munster. So he's an analyst. He covers a couple different stocks. Um, Apple would be uh, one of them. Um, and uh, he brings to light like um, that Tesla is thinking about getting into lithium mining and securing their own lithium mine due to the increased prices in lithium. Um, now, lithium is a very common element. It's basically just about everywhere 
It's just a matter of building a processing plant to extract it. That's the difficulty. But the actual element itself is very, very common. So this is very interesting, and here it is. La last time he made a comment about Twitter, nobody thought anything of it, and then he became the largest shareholder and joined the board, Gene. So what do you think about Tesla getting into the mining business? I'm not surprised, just as I was not surprised to see Elon get involved with Twitter. And this is something that is seems like it's just kind of a frivolous headline from Friday afternoon, but it's really important to understand the dynamic between Tesla and traditional auto. This is true vertical integration, not only taking it from uh, the point of uh, how the manufacturing facility played out, what they did yesterday at Giga Texas, but going to getting, uh, these are not rare elements, but getting elements and getting contracts on those. They've been doing that for a long time. Now getting into the mining of that, that ultimately is an understanding about what it takes to build a car, a computer on wheels in the future. And uh, this is a step beyond what we've seen with their futures contracts and their, uh, their deals that they have with other uh, elements. Uh, but again, we mm. don't see any traditional auto doing this. And I think it's yet score one for Elon and his vision just to take it to the next level. And I think you're going to see uh, this. Uh, I think there's a high probability that they ultimately go there. And for the dividend income, we've just crossed over $400 in earned dividends. So we've earned $419.83 in dividends so far in the portfolio. Uh, each year we're earning $679.08 in passive income from this portfolio. So just money while I sleep and just go about my day. We're just making this money in the background. Um, every month we're averaging $56.59. Every, every week we're doing $13.06. Daily we're doing $1.86. And we are. This is very close. So just 14 cents more per day, and I'm going to hit my goal of hitting two dollars a day in dividends or sixty dollars per month of passive income. So I'm just taking it in steps. Uh, just have little goals of earning, you know, one dollar a day, then two, then three, then four, then five, and you know, you can see. You know, when you're earning several dollars per day, earning an extra dollar per day will take a lot less time. And that's the snowball effect of dividend investing, having your dividends just compound and grow and become bigger and build upon themselves and eventually just becoming larger than my monthly contributions, which is the point I want to get to. And then we can, you know, reinvest right back into the same business. Or if there's a better opportunity out there, we can take advantage of a great company falling. So Starbucks right now would be a great example of that. Uh, just a company that falls out of favor. So if you've watched the whole video, please subscribe to the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, uh, you know, any thoughts on any of the topics discussed today, or uh, any good deals out there in the stock market that you're spotting. All right, have a great day, everybody.